Thank you all for coming. Wonderful to be here. Wonderful to have you for this exciting event of the UW Environmental and Energy Law Program. We are going to have a couple of phases of the event, so I want to just give you a brief roadmap of what to expect. I will be introducing Dean Matthew to offer some opening remarks. After that, we'll hear from our featured speaker, uh, Professor Rebecca Batsby's. And that will take us to about uh, after Q&A, one o'clock, maybe a little bit after, we'll take a very brief networking break, and then we'll try to reconvene by 1.15 for our panel discussion. Our distinguished panel will be offering reactions to Professor Bradsby's lecture, um, but certainly those of you in our online and in-person audience who are opportunity to ask questions will be happy to hear Professor Bradsby's lecture coming shortly. So, um, my name is Randall Bate. I am the uh, Assistant Dean for Environmental Law Studies for the GW um, program here. Uh, our Assistant Dean for Energy Law, uh, Nacio, is here as well. And uh, we work together on many of these initiatives. And this, this particular event is one of many where the intersections between energy and, and environment are, are apparent in this uh, social justice space as you appear today. Um, my my role primarily and briefly is to introduce uh, our dean of law school, Dean Dana Bowen Matthew, and I'll start by saying that uh, Dean Matthew is a Harold H. Green Professor of Law and Dean of our law school. She is a leader in public health and civil rights law, who focuses on disparities in health, healthcare, and social determinants of health. So certainly. Um, it, you could not be better positioned to be giving our opening remarks today as, as an expert in some of the topics that you're going to be hearing about today. She's also a founder and inaugural faculty director of GW's newly chartered Equity Institute. Uh, again, you're seeing this ongoing theme of her relevance for our focus today, which this Equity Institute is an interdisciplinary research hub dedicated to addressing racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic justice, uh, which is a big focus for us today. She is a prolific writer, the author of two best selling books, Just Medicine, A Cure for Racial Inequality in American Healthcare, and Just Health, Treating Structural Race Racism to Heal America. She's also the co author of a case book on public health, law, ethics, and policy. Um, so we're incredibly fortunate that, that Dean Matthews is here to join us today. and. Uh, she has really been a source of, of unwavering support for our program. We're, we're deeply grateful for that. Um, of course, you've heard that her background is very relevant for what you're going to hear about today. We are in the process of building out the social justice dimensions of our environmental energy law program, and she has been just a fantastic source of um, both uh, support in spirit, but in support in person. And I'm one who believes that actions speak louder than words, and it's just wonderful how regularly she is able to find time in her incredibly busy schedule to attend and open our events in, in this program. Uh, so I, I know she could be doing a dozen other things in, in a dozen other places, but we are just delighted that she's here to open uh, with some remarks for us today. Dean Matthew. I feel more delighted and, and uh, more excited than we have Randy. I don't know if you guys have been watching his, I, I don't know if you have a Twitter feed or I tell an old lady right now, <laughs> one of those social media things. <laughs> uh, but Randy's gone all over the country talking um, and presenting. And I'm just really impressed with the breadth of the activity and the representation and the change that you make you're doing. So I really feel very fortunate um, to be a part of the work that you are doing, Randy and Donna Atanasio. I love it when I see you, you're like, uh, and by the way, the country of Vietnam is coming to see me today, and all of the, that you do to strengthen, to grow, and to represent our energy portion of the energy and environmental law program is outstanding, and I really appreciate being your colleague. Um, so as um, Randy said, I'm Dana Matthew, my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am privileged to lead a school that has a mission, a vision statement that's relevant to what you're doing today. Um, our vision statement says that GW Law is a global law school that exists to have an impact on the law, some things in the middle, 
um, and equips students to shape solutions to the pressing challenges of our time. Um, that is what you will be doing today, and I'm thrilled um, not only that you are doing it in an area that's so near and dear to my heart, um, but also that you are doing it in a way that will be heard and felt in communities, not only here in the Washington, D.C. area, but around the country and around the world. So congratulations. I'd like to begin by extending a very warm Welcome, along with my sincere gratitude to the distinguished guest speaker who you will hear later on today, the City University of New York School of Law, Professor Rebecca Bradsby's. Thank you very much for being with us. She, as you will hear, is the author of Environmental Justice Chronicle, and uh, I also want to say thank you to the impressive panel, Emily Hammond, our Emily Hammond, I say. Uh, Dr. Sonia LeBlanc, Professor Monica Sanders, we're proud to host you um, at this conference. Environmental justice starts from a couple of basic prepositions. And of course, now I'm going to go off script because I'm going to embellish those uh, because this, again, is dear to my heart. The first proposition is that no communities are disposable. Um, I want to add to that no communities are superior or inferior to one another. Secondly, that the environmental burdens and benefits of our society should be distributed equitably and fairly. And third, that communities should have a voice in decisions that affect their air, their water, and their lands. On March 21st, 2023, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its most recent synthesis report, and the news was quite grim. We face unprecedented challenges and the window for action grows ever narrower, but the core message from the report is that fairness is a climate solution. The Biden administration has put environmental justice at the center of its environmental policy. And for this reason, the United States and the world have made great strides in bringing more voices into the conversation about how to respond to climate change. But we need to deliver on the promises the promises of environmental justice in order to truly put treatment, excuse me, put in order to truly put fair treatment and meaningful involvement into all aspects of environmental decision making. Today's program focuses on building the next generation of environmental leaders, and that's something we've been doing and shaping, as you heard from the innovate, not only recently, but for a our program was established at the beginning of the modern environmental law era and continues to expand to provide the next generation of environmental and energy lawyers with the tools that they need in order to tackle local, national, and international challenges that are facing the planet and its inhabitants. I'm proud to say that the host of today's program, our environmental and energy law program, is actively engaged in building out a social justice dimension of this work. It starts with teaching our students. And we have now, thanks to our hosts, new classes in environmental justice, climate change law and justice, urban environmental justice and public health and indigenous peoples and the environment. These are all new classes. Thanks to Andy uh, and others who are on our faculty. We're also in the early planning, planning stages of a new clinic. I didn't see that at the first, so I'm like, yay, yes, please, let's do that yesterday. GW Law's innovative new international double degree program in energy, environmental, and climate law is now accepting applications for the 2023-24 academic year. And this is another characteristic of what I think uh, Donna and Randy and others are leading, and that is an interdisciplinarity connection between the law school and other parts of the university that I think is so important and such an exciting hallmark of their work. The program enables students to receive two LLM degrees, one in academic year from two universities covering both US and European Union law, an LLM in energy and environmental law from GW law, and an LLM in energy and climate law from the University of Groningen. Please spread the word about this exciting new program. We also have an exciting lineup of programs coming up on rights-based climate in uh, litigation, as well as a distinguished lecture 
on global climate and energy justice. Let me highlight a couple of these. On April 3rd, which is just around the corner, we're hosting a panel discussion on climate justice for Latin American indigenous people. This will feature experts and advocates who will address pressing issues in Latin American indigenous people's uh, uh, environments and, that, uh, and their fight in order to secure climate justice. Then on April 6th and 7th, GW Law is proud to host our 2023 Shapiro Environmental Law Symposium. It's titled, Conserving Our Nation's Biodiversity. Colon Progress, Obstacles and Solutions for America's 30 by 30 Initiatives. The annual symposium hosted by our Environmental and Energy Law Program brings leading professors, scholars, policymakers, and environmental experts to GW to address pressing issues of environmental and energy law. The 2023 symposium, co-sponsored by the Environmental Law Institute, University of Oregon Environmental and Natural Resources Law Center, and Web Wildlands Network will focus on how to improve our nation's environmental and natural resource laws to reach the Biden administration's America the Beautiful goal of conserving 30% of, of, conserving of the nation's lands and waters by the year 2030. Let me conclude with a few thank yous. Again, today's program would not have been made possible without the hard work of Dean Randy Bate, our assistant dean for environmental law studies and a leading light in the field. I extend my sincere gratitude to Claudia Delgado and Yancy, thank you, Di, for their tireless work and expert planning in bringing today's event. So on behalf of the entire GW Law community, thank you again for the work that you're about to do. And I will borrow a phrase from one of my favorite organizations because the planet needs a lawyer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Matthew, for those inspiring remarks. And uh, it's certainly an honor now to introduce our speaker for today. And uh, on that subject of being a light and being a vision and an inspiration. Uh, Again, also on the theme of actions speak louder than words, this is the second time I've invited Professor Bratzvies to speak at an event involving her fantastic work. The previous one was two years ago at my previous institution, and I remain uh, indebted and inspired by the work that she's doing on environmental justice. So when you think about what interdisciplinarity really means, it ought to be tattooed to Professor Bratzvies' forehead. I mean, this is really yeah. what we have. <laughs> Thank to you. to look up to when 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 you're talking about academics that serve the community uh, and and serve the profession, uh, her work in this environmental justice chronicle series is, is quite visionary and it's inspired many many people at all levels of engagement from communities to youth to college students, law students, law professors. So um, it's it's really an honor to. Uh, to involve her in this event and, and help us build that following and that inspiration here at Gina Law and our Environmental Energy Law Program. Uh, and so her, her distinguished bio is, is in our event page and I'll, I'll let you read up on that. But uh, I encourage you certainly, if you haven't yet, to, to steal one of the remaining uh, uh, books on the table before you came in today, the registration table, uh, the Environmental Chronicles uh, series has three different graphic novels and comic books, whichever <laughs> term you prefer, uh, that were drafted by Professor Braspies and, and are just fantastic in raising the issues uh, across many contexts in environmental justice. So we are privileged to have her give uh, a talk that is built on those uh, stories and, and uh, delivers a message of inspiration for our next generation of environmental leaders. Professor Braspies. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Um, at first, I want to just acknowledge that we're uh, on the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Skyway and Acosta people who've served as stewards of these lands and the waterways for generations. Their people continue to thrive in this region and still honor and celebrate their culture. 
and the relationship to the land. So it's truly a privilege to be here with you in this place on this land to talk about this. Um, so I'm going to tell you about a pro. Oh, granted. I'm about to advance the screen without actually sharing. Always oh, good. All right. Um, Okay, so this is me. All right, so I'm going to tell you about a project I'm very proud of, the Environmental Justice uh, Chronicles, a series of environmental justice uh, graphic novels or comic books. So far, there are three, and um, I'm going to focus on the first one, which is Maya's Lot, because we've been using it in New York City and across the country to build, as Lynn said, a new generation of environmental leaders, but importantly, a generation of urban environmental leaders. Our world is increasingly urban. And uh, if people who live in cities don't view protecting the environment as their plot, as something that affects them and that they actually live in an environment. And every time I go into a school, I ask, the first thing I ask students is, do you live in an environment? There's always at least one kid who says no, because the environment is somewhere else. It's somewhere pristine with trees and bunnies. And I am all in favor of trees and bunnies. But if people who live in cities don't view protecting the environment as protecting themselves and their environment, then we are not going to make the progress that we need. Um, so before I get started, just a quick show of hands. How many of you can think of an environmental injustice either that you've experienced in your life or that you've seen? Uh, pretty much um, and how many of you can think of an environmental justice victory? A specific change that was made. Yeah, many, many fewer hands, right? Um, that's why we wrote the Environmental Justice Chronicles. We want to talk about how to win. How do we do this? How do we build a better world? And what kind of what does that look like? So um, this is a photo from a New York City public school classroom. Um, and it asks the key questions. Who has power? Whose stories are not being told, and who benefits from the stories that are being told? First, let me say that Maya's Law began as a collaboration. It's a, it's a collaboration between a law professor and an artist, both intent on testing the limits of our professions. My scholarship focuses on questions of environmental justice and human rights. Uh, I had just started the CUNY Center for Urban Environmental Reform and was looking for a way to reach new audiences, different audiences, who quite frankly would never dream of picking up one of my lot of articles. The, uh, the artist that I work with, Charlie LaGreca, was deeply involved in Comic Book Classroom, a pop culture-based literacy project, and we saw an opportunity to combine our interests and create visually pleasing standalone stories that are authentic stories, but would um, also serve as a powerful teaching tool for environmental protection and environmental justice. So Maya's Lot was our attempt to think creatively about how to bring environmental messages to a generation that's steeped in a much more visual and more interactive way of learning and to open conversations about what kind of a society do we want to have. When we began this in 2014, it was much more out there than it is now. I mean, graphic novels are sort of John Lewis did one, right? It's, it's very much in the mainstream. In 2014, not so much. Um, it was a challenge trying to convince people that this was a legitimate way to communicate serious messages. So these are our core principles. Um, environment, let me just, environmental justice is social justice. Youth voices matter. We put young people at the center of everything that we do and um, communities speak for themselves. Right? It's not my job to tell people what their priorities are, what they should care about, but it is my job to stand alongside them as they identify those priorities to help them build the skills that will let them advocate for change. And the most important <coughs> principle, I think, that drops in all the others is that everybody has the right to breathe clean air, drink clean water, and live, work, and play in a safe environment. Not just people with the right accent, the right complexion, the right zip code, everybody. So um, Maya's Lot is set in the fictional town of Forestville, which could be any place that struggles with environmental injustice. And it began, as all good books should, with pot. Because Lulu, right, that's our, uh, the story's villain, and that's an environmental actor. It stands for locally undesirable land use. Things like hazardous waste facilities, landfills, power plants, Lulus are locally undesirable because they pose environmental and health risks for the people who live near them. 
And one thing we know for sure in this country and around the world, and here in DC and in New York, and that is that these MULUs, these locally undesirable land uses, are disproportionately cited in Latin American communities. So the earliest environmental justice advocacy involves communities organizing to fight against hazardous waste disposal, Warren County, uh, North Carolina, and Houston, Texas. And in New York City, right where I'm based, environmental justice organizations fought epic battles over how four, one, two, three, four, four black and brown communities for 75% of the burden of handling and processing the city's municipal waste. These advocacy efforts ultimately culminated in something that was called the fair share plan that reduced how much of the city's waste went into these four communities. Um, and we wanted to pay homage to that work by centering our story around waste as well. Quite frankly, toxic waste works better in a comic book than municipal waste does. So Green Solutions proposal to cite a toxic waste facility in Forest Hills. And leaders, uh, readers learn alongside Maya, the young heroine, as she helps organize her community um, to prevent the siting of this hazardous waste facility in this already overburdened community. Through her leadership, and she's a kid, she's a teenager, but through her leadership, the community successfully opposes the hazardous waste facility. And at the end of the book, the abandoned lot that was slated to be the hazardous waste facility gets turned into much needed uh, green space in the community. So it stands alone as a story, like you can just read it and it's sort of fun, I think. It's beautifully done. The artist is incredibly talented, but it also provides valuable environmental justice lessons. It introduces readers to street science, to basic administrative procedures, and to effective community organizing. I just want to emphasize that this has been a collaboration between me and the artist, and in case you wonder, lawyers and artists have really, really different work patterns. Been a challenge, um, but it's also been a collaboration between the two of us and the young people we're hoping to reach. So Charlie, the artist, and I spent um, six weeks at PS122 in Queens testing our ideas for this first book with students. And I'm showing you this particular image, which is in the middle of the book, because it was some very important feedback we got from the students that the book sort of dragged in the middle, and maybe we could jazz it up a bit. So um, Earth Girl was born. And Earth Girl actually has, uh, comes back in the third book. Um, so if you grabbed Troops Run, you'll see that Earth Girl makes a, a reprise. Um, but if there's a lesson for my talk, and probably a bunch of them, but the key lesson I think is dare to break boundaries. Be creative. Collaborations make you better. They make you stronger. There are things you don't know that you don't even know you don't know. And working with other people will help you see. Yeah, we are truly stronger together. So we turned Maya's Lot into a Common Core workshop for New York City public students. And the students love it. They get to be creative. And they get to realize that art and storytelling are actually an important part of learning. They're not just a luxury. The U.S. test-driven culture gives so little room for this kind of exploration. But through Maya's Lot, we partnered with science teachers, math teachers, English teachers, social studies teachers, health teachers. Right? We can bring um, you know, this kind of this creative energy into all aspects of the curriculum. Each student gets a copy of the book. Um, professors and law students, well, me, professor, and law students from CUNY visit the students in their classroom. Students first they practice the close reading and um, that the Common Core focuses on, right? And in small groups, they, they talk about what happened in the story, what clues they glean from the, um, the design and the pictures in the background, they learn vocabulary words, and then they create backstories. And then they speculate about what happens after the story ends. And then law students would work with each group of students to talk about the regulatory and legal structure that these environmental decisions get made in, and the students create their own environmental justice uh, comic books, and then we, they identify the environmental justice issue that they care the most about, and we create a campaign to try to build some change. So I'm going to tell you about one, uh, one such campaign. Um, this was probably our most ambitious campaign. It was a, a campaign about subway noise at PS85. Um, this, this school, PS85, was built in 1907. That elevated subway line, you can't see it that well, maybe. Um, but it was built a decade later in 1917. It is 50 feet from the school. And this photo uh, ran in the New York Times. 
an, an article about the campaign that we were running to try to do something about the subway bus. Um, you know, the noise burden was really intolerable in the school. The school doesn't have air conditioning. It's from 1907. And uh, so in the summer, all the windows had to be open, and not just the summer, like September, October, May, June. As our climate gets warmer, more and more of the year is too hot, and the students need the windows open. Um, and somehow they're supposed to learn how to read, how to add, how to do all kinds of things with the subway going by every 40, uh, sorry, every two minutes. Um, and mind you, the standardized tests that they have to take, they don't stop the train. And of course, those are pitched as some kind of a, a neutral, even benchmark, right? When students are sitting 50 feet from trains taking these tests. So after reading the book and doing that groundwork I was just talking about, the students do the really fun part. They spend a day with the artist, Charlie Lebranda, and they identify, they've identified an environmental justice issue that they're concerned about, right? And with him, they personify it, or in this case, robotify it, and turn it into a, an environmental justice villain. So he, he brainstorms with them, he gets ideas, and then he draws it. And so these students identified the subway noise as their environmental justice villain, and they created this villain, uh, Sonic Booth. Right, so each week for the rest of the workshop, we would um, talk about how environmental decisions are made, who makes the decisions, under what kind of institutional constraints, what, what kind of discretion des decision makers have, and where might the students as members of the public participate and what kinds of participation are likely to be fruitful. And at the same time, in their other classes, they're learning about the health and health noise, the physics of sound, and the rules governing noise in buildings and in schools. And they identified the ways that they thought the noise affected their learning success. So each student made a, comp this is them in their, um, their computer lab, each student made a, um, their own comic book. And I'm just gonna show you some of these. And it was really cool watching them, right? As they're there making their comic books, they're researching, what's the world's most polluted city? How high are the asthma rates in my neighborhood? Um, how loud is a cabin? Like they're collecting all of this information and putting it to use in making their own story. So here are just a couple of the stories they made, right? Sound wars, the soundproofer, saving the garden, because you know, there are lots of issues that matter. Um, and lots of sound wars issues, right? The soundproofer, the battle of sound. So then using the information they learned, they created an advocacy campaign. We have them, but this is th these are their words, this is their campaign. Um, I translated that in case you don't read second grade. I think we should stop the trade noise because the teacher had to yell over it every day. And if, they, and if we stop, it'll be easier to learn, finally give people headaches, and it hurts their ears. Stopping the train noise will solve these problems. That's why I learned how to stop the train noise. The students created a petition. They wrote letters to the Department of Education and to the MTA. They created petitions. Um, and we shot a video. It's on um, YouTube. You can see it if you want. It's very, very low budget, but it shows that like, this is shot from the window of the school. The trains go by, you can see it go by every two minutes, it lasts 40 seconds. It's really loud. It's not a reasonable environment to ask kids to learn in. Now, interestingly, right, the reaction to this student campaign at first was Maya's lot brought to life. Community attitudes were like, well, what are we going to do? They're not going to move to school, right? Um, they're not going to shut down the subway. We're poor, this is Queens, nobody cares about us. Yet, as the young people organized their community for change, the solution was also like by his lot come to life. This is a press conference that we held on the sidewalk between the school and the subway. If you look to the one side, you see the school, the other side, you see the subway. We had to stop every two minutes while the trains went by as well. These are all elected officials standing there, the people who are, well, some of them anyway. Um, I shared the noise villain the students had created, and we made change. Like every environmental justice victory, it was partial. It was contingent, but it was a victory. The DOE made electrical upgrades to the school to allow for air conditioning, and elected officials funded the purchase of air conditioners, so they don't have to open the windows anymore. Right? The subway's still there, the school's still there. There's still noise, but the school level is so much lower that learning is possible in a way that it wasn't before. And the educational victories were even more significant, I think. The students met their federal, state, and elected representatives. They spoke with reporters, 
and they generally acted as ambassadors for environmental justice within their community. And there's no question it helped them translate their grade school level civics into a real world appreciation for how to use law and to use regulation to achieve outcomes. In three miles, last surge, we did a pre-survey before we started this. Few students, they all knew there were three branches of government. They had no idea what that meant. Um, right? They, they didn't really know whether agencies were part of the executive, legislative, or judicial branches. They weren't really clear how laws were made and how they were implemented. Not one child could name three agencies for defining environmental justice, which is you know, not their fault, right? I'm not blaming them, but just sort of saying this was the baseline. By the time the programs end, the, the students could comfortably identify multiple agencies and understood that there were city agencies, state agencies, and federal agencies. Um, they could fit that into our constitutional system of separation of powers. Virtually all knew that fair treatment and meaningful involvement were the core of environmental justice. And they self-reported a high level of satisfaction with the workshop and expressed an interest in reading and learning more about environmental justice. And this was true, the best thing about this, this was true for advanced learners and reluctant readers alike. It didn't matter how well they did in school, that this was a, sort of a general experience. And since then, Mai's Law has been used in colleges and law school classrooms across the country and around the world. Sometimes people let me know that they're using it, most of the time they don't. And uh, I, it's so cool. I'll find out. I'll be chatting with some undergraduate student or a new law student, and I'll say, "Oh, I read that in my sociology class," or "Oh, I saw that." And like, that's amazing to me. And okay, this isn't public yet, so you can't tell anyone. But um, I just found out, like on the way down here, found out that um, that Maya's Lot was awarded EPA's 2023 Clean Air Excellence Award for Education and Health. It'll be announced sometime around Earth Day, and uh, needless to say, I'm thrilled but, um, and honored, but I just wanted to, to say that because I'm very excited. Uh, most importantly, oh, oh, this is the second book, um, right? We, this one um, teaches students about per the permitting process and how to intervene in the permitting process, what kind of experts you need. Um, this is the third book. It has our characters entering electoral politics on a climate justice platform. And um, so this is um, one of the other things that I wound up doing. We made a video in partnership with Mount Sinai's uh, community outreach program and the New York Hall of Science and the New York Department of Health. So we're bringing together right, people with, with Pots of wisdom and knowledge and putting them at the service of communities that need access to that expertise so that they can become better advocates for themselves. Um, that's me at a screening of uh, my thought, which is certainly something I never thought I would be doing. Um, I also have been to Comic Cons. We talk about going out of my comfort zone. Right. Um, we did, this is one of those books. Picture always makes me a little sad. This was one of the very last things we did before COVID shut everything down at the um, National Institute of Environmental Health Service Partnership meeting for um, environmental justice. We presented a, a poster about some of the work we had done with Maya's Lot. Oh, I missed the stuff. Um, Chicago included Maya's Lot in their equity curriculum. And one of the really cool things about this is that they focused it on um, their bilingual education. And so they were focusing on topics like activista, Volsica, and um, you know, it's been very well received there as well. Now, one of the um, perhaps the most important thing is a series of ongoing partnerships that we have developed. These are all the logos of some of our partners. Um, we created a uh, citizen science teacher training program that ran until it stopped in 2019. We work with public school teachers, training them on environmental science, on how to test air quality, on environmental advocacy, on what comes with environmental justice. And they then in turn brought these lessons to their students, who keep the book as well, and help them with that. And then we would support them as they implemented these projects in their classrooms. Students learned about pollution, about issues in their neighborhood, how to collect data, the difference between data and anecdote, how to make, make a, a, a case, how to analyze and report data, and how to advocate for change. And then we would host a sustainability summit at the law school. Many of these students have never set foot in the institution of higher learning. 
And we would bring them into the law school so that that felt like, right, that was a space that they had been in, they were comfortable with, they had shown it and presented it, so that for the rest of their lives, they would take that with them, that this is a space that belongs to me. I am welcome in this space. Um, and we would invite local officials. So students present their findings to an audience that includes elected officials, political and UN dignitaries, public health experts, um, and, um, and then this is, I'm gonna stop in a minute, but um, this is an ongoing project. It's, can't quite read it, unfortunately. It is a, um, a, a small grant that we got to begin a process. We just got a much bigger EPA grant to, to do it. An um, ongoing process studying the environmental justice impacts of the waste transfer stations. Come back to the beginning about waste, right? The waste transfer stations in Jamaica, Queens, which is a significantly overburdened neighborhood. And we're using a community science research approach um, bringing together scientists, community members, high school students, and lawyers to, um, to develop data. And you can see the principal investigators are community members as well as scientists, doctors, and experts. And we also sued them because we're lawyers, and we just settled a Clean Water Act case with significant changes to the um, waste transfer stations that are hopefully going to make a big difference in terms of owner and PM 2.5 that this community is exposed to. Um, we also did a project around the census, which was a lot of fun. Uh, we started it before the pandemic and it wound up obviously getting moved online, but the New York State Assembly mailed the Census Matters comment to 44,000 hard to count families. We translated it into a bunch of languages. And um, we also just began this project with UNP, uh, creating short comic vignettes about the dangers that environmental defenders face around the world. Uh, these are the first two. The Keepers is set in Kenya. It tells the story of the Sangor people who are forest dwellers being evicted so their lands can be used as conservation lands in a red scheme. Um, the Song of the Sundarbans is set in Bangladesh and it tells of local and nationwide resistance to the Bengali government's decision to build an enormous coal-fired power plant in the Sundarbans, which is the largest intact mangrove forest in Asia. The third story is almost done. These are both online, by the way, on the UNEP website. They'll be on my website soon. Um, the third story is set in Cambodia's Prelong Forest and it tells the story of um, forest dwellers who have organized themselves to patrol and protect against illegal logging. And the fourth book is set, fourth story will be set in Colombia. Um, we're just starting that one. So I wanna end by saying, we can change things. We can make this better. We can meet the deadlines that IPCC is telling us we're facing. But if we're gonna do that, we have to do it together. We need everybody. So I'm gonna stop there and um, thank you all for coming. And I would love your questions. And I will pretend that I can answer. But I'll probably pass them off to the panel. I don't know what I'm about it. So, thank you. <laughs> Who's got a question? I am a law professor. I could call it people. I have a question between the difference between Lulu's and um, brown lots. Uh, for more industrial mm -hmm. polluted areas. Okay, so the difference between uh, a Lulu and a brownfield, right? A brownfield is an abandoned site. It's a site that is no longer in operation, but it is. it was a former industrial facility, so it has all kinds of contaminants on it that may or may not be known. And the idea of brownfields are part, there's an, a, a push for brownfields redevelopment, and that is to bring these brownfields back into useful life in the communities rather than have them be abandoned lots and decaying forests. So um, hopefully they will, when they are uh, restored and one of the fights is over what kind of a level of cleanup is necessary in order to bring a brownfield back into use. Um, hopefully when they're restored, they will not become Lulu's. Lulu's are facilities that are in operation. So a locally undesirable land use is something that is happening now that is causing harm in the community. So it could be a power plant, it could be a waste transport station, it could be a factory, it, it, it could be a um, not the cracking plant, depending on where you are, it'll be a different kind of a thing, but it is an active facility 
that has significant negative impacts in terms of health and environmental safety for the community that surrounds it. Um, we were in class last week talking about um, biodiversity and developing green spaces, mm -hmm. and somebody asked about um, the interplay between bringing green spaces to for more environmental justice communities and that trade off between the gentrification that could happen in that area. I'm just hoping you could touch on that. Yeah, that's a huge issue because what we don't want to be doing is helping communities as they organize and fight for what they are entitled to, which is right, clean air, clean water, and um, land that is safe to live, play, and work on. And then once they have some victories, have them be forced out because all of a sudden this is a desirable neighborhood and uh, rents get, you know, uh, investors come in and say, hey, you know, we could build a bunch of luxury condos here. And and then the prices go up. So, you know, that's a huge challenge. Um, there are a lot of different ways that cleanups can be structured, that that um, development can be structured to build in protection for communities. There's also a, a movement, um, it's in New York City, I'm sure it's here as well, Just Green Enough, right, which is let's get enough green space in our community to benefit us in terms of our health and our, um, our well-being, but not so much that it attracts that sort of onslaught. Um, you know, it's a very fine line to walk, and I'm not the one, certainly, to tell the neighborhood what kind of green space they should have. But for people who are advocating for the neighborhoods, that's always a challenge that they are struggling with. Like, how much is enough for us versus how much is going to attract the attention of developers that will change the character of our neighborhood in ways that will force us out? It's a real, real problem. Uh, I'm curious. For your work on, uh, with the UNEP, mm -hmm. um, given that with Maya's Law and that series, how a lot of it focused on the regulatory or permitting processes uh, that, that occur locally and lot, advocating elected officials, and there's not really a parallel for that on the international level, how did your approach to the international UNEP work differ from the local? Well, each one of these stories is a story in a place, right? And that place has a legal regime. And often the stories that we're telling are about things that are illegal under the legal regime in the place. And so we work closely with people on the ground. Again, I, as somebody who lives in New York City, am not in a position to be like, this is the story about the same art people, right? What we do is we collaborate with people and help, the, help develop what story they want told about their situation. And it is rooted in what is legal or illegal about what is happening under the laws that govern the space, and then sort of putting that in the context of <clears throat> what does it mean to have a human right to a healthy environment, and how do we have to think differently about decisions that are made in specific places under specific sets of laws in light of that right. It's a work in progress in every in process. But it has been amazing collaborating with people around the world. We have a question. Oh, um, so what opportunities are there to volunteer in the DC area? Well, funny you should ask. Because <laughs> I'm going to be spending a lot more time in DC in the near future. Um, and I'm, I, I don't know the answer to that now, but I bet some of the people who are on the panel do. And um, that's what I'm going to be sort of trying to learn about and be able to communicate to people. Um, in the fall semester. Any yeah. thoughts about taking your um, this concept mm -hmm. and extending it to energy equity issues? Um, you know, a lot of times when people talk about energy injustice, mm -hmm. they immediately go to, oh, there's a power plant, but there's mm -hmm. problems of how do poor people and communities of color access solar energy on the same basis as Absolutely. wider communities? Um, how do they get energy insecurity, energy poverty, the energy burden, any of those? And those are often the communities are moved around the energy generating facilities, right? They bear all of the burdens in terms of the pollution and get none of the benefits in terms of the energy that is created. Um, I would love to do that. Um, this is, it's really a capacity issue and a funding issue, but, you know, we just finished this fall, we, before the elections, the day for that, we finished 
the uh, troops run and we were distributing it as part of the Canal Vote campaign. Um, the next project will probably focus on issues of energy justice. The second book, Venus Plant, is about the environmental justice impacts of energy processing, but it doesn't delve as much into who has access to the energy that is generated and on what terms. And I would love to go there. I just haven't had the opportunity yet. Did you have it? No? I thought somebody in the middle. Okay. Well, thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, actually, we are uh, visiting scholars from Central Asian country, Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my uh, question is, do you uh, consider your collaboration with Central Asian countries? I mean, uh, working with public school and teachers. I mean, because nowadays, today, uh, recently, a group of uh, uh, teachers has arrived here. Uh, for about half a uh, year uh, to do an internship here and to learn the U.S. like practices. Uh, in case, Absolutely. Yeah. I would love to do that. And in that case, later, can I get to you and get the kind of... Yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, I would love to figure out a way that we can collaborate. I certainly can give you our materials, but maybe we can, you know, develop something that would make sense in the context of, you know, wherever where people are. So I haven't been to Kazakhstan, but I've been um, in the area nearby. So, you know, I, I have vague sense of what the issues might be, but I would love to talk more. Yeah, because our government uh, does uh, like uh, provide funding mm -hmm. and then the Fulbright, uh, uh, last week we did have the uh, representatives of Fulbright International Organ uh, Education Organization, and they like informed us that there is the funding uh, for like American uh, researchers who are like uh, eager to do research in our region. So yeah, later, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, let's definitely talk. And on that note, we're, we're going to take a short uh, networking break for about 10 minutes. Uh, there should be food and beverages remaining uh, in, the, in the room next door, the, the, the green ball, it's called. Uh, and uh, we will reconvene for our panel discussion, which will be reactions to what we've heard from Professor Pratsby's from a variety of perspectives. Um, and uh, we, will, we will conclude uh, at, at 2 o'clock. So see you at... Uh, about 10 after one. Thank you. So you didn't have to take my word for it. Uh, certainly listening to Professor Brasfield was the source of inspiration and, and leadership that, that I conveyed uh, that she, the role she's played in the environmental justice field. Um, certainly there are many impactful scholars in academia, but very few are really out there making a difference uh, in communities and, and really practicing what they preach on a regular basis. And so it reminds me of a, a, a quote one of my friends shared with me uh, that goes, never deprive someone of hope because it may be all they have. And when I think about this generation of uh, environmental leaders, hope may be all they have with the, the climate anxiety and the the compromised future that a lot of our environmental threats are presenting, but uh, it's work that Professor Bradspees is doing that arms this generation with perhaps more than hope, some tools, some some vision about what what can be done and how it can be done. I think that's uh, that's incredibly meaningful work. So she's not the only one doing meaningful work in this space, and so our, the second half of our session is designed to provide an interdisciplinary response to uh, Professor Bradsby's lecture from a variety of perspectives uh, from our distinguished panel of experts. So you'll be hearing, um, and, and I'll just be referring to names and titles. Their distinguished bios are in our event page so we can uh, get right into the content here. But we'll first hear from Professor Monica Sanders. She's the founder of the Undivine Project uh, and doing very impactful work in this space. Um, and then we will next hear from um, Dr. Sonia LeBlanc, who's right here at GW uh, at, in this building, this school, uh, the School of Engineering and Applied Science. And, and her work is uh, one of the reasons why um, environmental law is only uh, as successful as our collaboration outside our spaces. So we, we need the we need the engineers uh, like Long to advance what law and policy is trying to do. So it's it's always very rewarding and 
interesting for me as someone who couldn't do math and science of any kind to, to learn how we can partner to better address these challenges that we have in environmental justice. Uh, and, and last and certainly not least, we're just delighted to have uh, Vice Provost Emily Cannon with us, who's a, a, a national leader on environmental energy and administrative law topics uh, and has had a longstanding role at uh, GW Law and particularly in our environmental and energy law program, uh, giving our program the, the, the national attention that it has received. So we are delighted to have three fantastic experts uh, to respond from a variety of perspectives to Professor Bradsby. So, uh, Monica, we'll start with you. Sounds good. Um, can you all hear me okay? All the way in the back? Okay, great. Because I didn't want to have to use the microphone if not. So people who want might not be able to. Ah, that's what it's going to And if people online can hear me, if you could pop a thumbs up into the chat or next to your name, that would be great for me and the other panelists as we go through. Um, so thank you so much, Dean Abate, for having me. Thank you, Professor Bradsby's, for your comments. You know, when I listen to you, I hear hope, I hear liberation. When I read Maya's lot, it challenged me to interrogate the workplace and how we create a sense of place, how we respect places and the people who occupy them, the places that we lose sometimes when we don't win. And what is the role of law and policy in regenerating and renewing and even supporting people and places? Um, so by way of a background, I'm from Southeast Louisiana, which is always on the radar when we talk about environmental justice, when we talk about divestment, when we talk about social justice. Um, it is also at the forefront when we talk about the wins that we get sometimes. So in my comments, I wanted to start by talking about how policy and law create the conditions by which we lose and sometimes denigrate and destroy places, but also how we have the opportunity if we're brave enough to reach forward on the other side. So I look at Maya's lot and I think about Cancer Alley and the fact that at one point in a very specific point in time in Louisiana's history, we decided that this was the best place for sugar production and that the people involved in the production of sugar were expendable. And then we used the law to enforce those decisions. One of the oldest criminal cases in environmental justice history is not an American case. It is found in the lower chamber of the French courts where the enslaved and indentured people working in what is now Cancer Alley in St. John the Baptist Parish petitioned for relief because they continue to have these mysterious lung ailments. The court actually decided not to award them directly, but to pay the plantation owners for their medical care. Over the course of the next 300 years, the land would change over from being the situs of sugar plantations to chemical and paper factories to now is the source of transfer stations, plastics, Formosa plants. And here comes the when. Up until recently, it was going to be the site of a grain elevator. And if any of you all have not, don't know what a grain elevator is, it is an infrastructure that this particular one was the size of the Statue of Liberty in New York, if you can think about scale and the amount of space and place removed and culture removed and damage that could possibly be done by something like this. But how many of you had never heard of Cancer Alley before? Right, 50-50. Most people know what it is, and here's the when, is because of the community's ability to tell their own stories and advocate for themselves. So just in the past couple of years, taking instruction from advocates before them, what we had was a win against the Wallace Grain Elevator, using the legal theory that was brought forth by Linda Bullard in the case in Houston, Texas, 30 years earlier, saying it was a civil rights violation to bring the case under civil rights law because the environmental law, particularly as interpreted at the state level in Louisiana, wasn't sufficient to address the harm. So there is a win in that. There is a win in that community with some advocacy support from university students, not unlike yourselves, to testify before the Committee to End Racial Discrimination at the United Nations and to get a letter written to President Biden 
acknowledging that racial justice, racial injustice, environmental injustice is a social justice issue, is an international human rights issue. So we have on principle now that what has taken place in this community with these people is not just a legal issue in the American context, there's an international principle which this violates. And so the challenge to us is, well, what do we do with that now? How do we take this as attorneys and advocates and students who are watching these developments and take this win and generate it right, in such a way that it helps other places? The second story I wanna to talk to you about is Detroit, because one of you all asked, when looking at Maya's lot, how do we balance creating green space and creating benefits up against gentrification? And at one point in its history, Detroit was an attraction for people of color, mostly African-Americans migrating from the South, but also immigrants from all over the country and all over the world to work in its auto industry. Right? It was once a source of pride, very much a part of American lore, right, to have a GM, a Ford car, and they were big, and they were bright, and they were shiny, and it was evidence of prosperity in this country. This was also the place where a lot of American music was born, not too far from these places in Detroit and Flint, where we're talking about in terms of environmental justice, very specific aspects of American culture were created. So there is a sense of place and a sense of culture underlying all of this. During the pandemic and during the decline, rightfully so, of using so many automobiles in this way for these purposes, more than 200 jobs and a still undetermined amount of people left this area. And then we learn about the water issues. And then we learn about the contamination from the factories. So it's becoming, you know, looking at the news stories, a textbook definition of overburdened. But sometimes when we look at overburdened communities, what we don't see is the social cohesion and the connection between the people who live there because the people also are the place. So now what you have in Detroit is community-led regenerative finance, buying back the block initiatives, which is where community members are getting together and crowdfunding the repurchasing of fallow land in their own community and converting it to urban gardens, beginning to understand how some of us have the privilege of understanding very well how to use blockchain technology and, and um, closed communities and these kinds of public ledgers, all of this together, right, to create value, to create new ways of communicating, to create new governance frameworks, are making their way into these communities. So now Detroit is known as a refi hub, regenerative finance hub. So the question to us as attorneys is, how do we create the right kinds of legal frameworks to give these people what they so desperately need is certainty, to make sure that the structures they are creating for themselves has the appropriate legal protection, right? That any one of or all of these governance structures they're creating for the regeneration of their community would pass a test in court. What is our role in helping them sustain the future that they are already carving out for themselves? Okay. The next thing that I wanted to talk to you all about is making the case for the principles behind some of the things that Professor Braspies has brought to us. Because again, when I'm thinking about place, I also think about the idea that where we have multiple axes of inequity and oppression, we also have multiple facets of assets, of history, of people, of ways of being and understanding that all of those on principle, both taking it from those of y'all who are studying environmental justice, the environmental justice principles, and also the work of Dr. David Pello before us, right? Looking at intersectionality, that all of these things do and must coexist if we are to address them holistically. And understanding that EJ takes place across multiple timelines, as in my first case of how all of this came to be in Louisiana and across multiple contexts, and thus it must be interdisciplinary in nature as both the Dean and the professor have told us, but also being unafraid to interrogate structures of power and institutions that can both support and pose a challenge to what we're trying to reach for. 
And so what are some ways that we could create these possibilities, take these principles and turn them into new infrastructure? And for me, I'm talking about legal infrastructure, but <laughs> hopefully legal infrastructure creates the conditions by which the built environment and the social environment and the financial environment can thrive. Is that understanding is that this fight for climate or environmental justice or social justice, whichever name under which the issue falls, is a coordination issue. It is about us understanding how to collaborate and coordinate with impacted communities, about collaborating and coordinating across disciplines, right? And about coordinating, collaborating across institutions, whether we are talking about legislatures generating the right kind of law, judges coming to understand the science and the issues and the social problems and how to appropriately administer and interpret the law all the way through agencies who are responsible for the government level funding and the support of communities. Understanding, particularly from my perspective, that as we are creating these wonderful new worlds in the next generation of the web, as we're looking at regenerative finance, as we're in some economies moving to digital service-based ways of being, is that not everyone is ready to come with us. And so we have to pay attention to the history that has been taught to us and learn how to incorporate the historical ways of addressing these in the world to come. And so how do we create the right frameworks that allows everyone to participate in a new iteration of how we conduct our business and society that can be connected, that can be green and can be equitable for everyone, right? And finally, understanding that this is a global issue. What we learned in hearing about the professor's work, both in New York and looking at what the NEP is doing, is that the community in New York, the community in New Orleans, the communities that we work with in DC, their efforts and their struggles, as well as their wins are translationals to the communities anywhere else that you can go in the world. As pointed out by the next iterations that I'm excited to read about in Colombia, in Southeast Asia, um, perhaps now in Central Asia, we'll see if that happens, um, has meaning for people outside of the space where they are inhabited. It's not hyper-localized. It is emblematic of global inequities that we have to challenge. And we do that through collaboration and coordination. And so how do we keep raising this, not just as we are questioning and problematizing institutional frameworks at the local level, but how do we globalize this? And how do we close distances so that we can collaborate? And I think that there is hope there. And I will end it on this. I've seen the wins in court. I've seen them at the UN. I watched the World Economic Forum, which is not always known as being a place that is focused on community, but <laughs> a community and a place unto itself, acknowledging right, that there has to be equity in how we address climate change, and there has to be equity in how we create new economic frameworks in a highly digitized world. And even sitting here in DC, those of us that get to live, work, and study in the district are watching a once in a generation amount of funding being directed towards community with a justice focus and that it being a legal requirement to do so. And so how do we curate this in such a way that it is sustainable, it is continuous, and that we move it through the next generation. So as awe-inspiring as it is, it is not so because it is a singular event, but it becomes our way of doing business going forward. So thank you for your attention. Well, right. Um, well, before I go into the comments that I prepared in advance, I want to offer for the interdisciplinary audience um, a thought because a couple of times um, I've heard um, how does infrastructure, how does technology respond? How does the law deploy it? And I find that a really interesting perspective because um, on the engineering side, I see it the reverse. Um, I really do see that um, from the technology perspective, um, it's there. The technology that's being deployed is ancient to us. Um, we are at the forefront of what we know is possible uh, technologically that might not make it out there in 20 years. So I see it kind of as this, um, this 
inverse of, of what was described where um, on the engineering front, the science front, um, we're waiting for the law and the policy to catch up to what it is that we're doing um, and to help guide um, how it should be deployed because we already know what's coming um, from that from that perspective of the, the technology piece. So I think it's interesting, right? Just, just in that aspect of like, how do we look at this um, is that I actually see it um, in, in an inverted way. Um, so my perspective um, draws much more from the area of energy um, than environmental justice. I'm very new uh, to the environmental justice um, movement and communities. And so I would say I'm still learning. I started that learning process a, a couple of years ago. I'm still learning. Um, and um, one of the things that I am trying to figure out in this process as we um, in our energy initiative are working on energy equity is to understand how the two come together, um, that it's not uh, interchangeable energy equity and environmental justice. And, and so I've been trying to understand um, the two approaches. Uh, and what I'd offer as thought, I don't have any answers, um, but what I'd offer as thought is from environmental justice, we see the activism. Um, and I thought that your comments were, uh, we're at the leading edge of what I see in environmental justice because it's not just activism, it is about solutions. Um, and I think that is where, I see the intersection with energy equity, I'm just in the energy space, is um, the activism brings the problem to the forefront. It puts the voices out there for us to hear. Um, and in the energy space um, and in the energy equity space, I see a pairing with solutions. Um, so what do we do about it? Um, how, how do we address the harms that have been done? Um, and so that's something where I think we are seeing both movements move towards, and I'm interested in seeing where that goes. Um, for From the energy equity perspective, um, what I think that we're seeing um, in a transition in thinking is um, not a perspective of these things are getting done. Oh, and make sure you're remembering equity. Oh, and make sure you're remembering social justice. But instead, with sustainable energy, realizing that this transition is our opportunity to put those who have been historically marginalized, those who are vulnerable communities, put them at the front of the line. Give that transition to them first and the power that comes with that transition, whether it means resilience, because you now have distributed electricity generation and storage and thus energy resources at your fingertips, in spite of what additional harms might become, you are at the forefront of being resilient. So let's put that in the hands of the communities who we've historically marginalized. So I see that with energy equity, we have this opportunity to use energy as an equity enabler. Um, what does that look like in communities? Um, I So I Prior to even getting a PhD, I was a high school teacher here in DC. Um, and so I am kind of like an on the ground type of person um, and struggle with being in higher education academia as a result. So I'd love to see your example. I'm like, oh, there, there are others out here. That's good. Um, and um, so I do like to get really granular. And when I came into the space, I've been working on you know, energy technologies for several years, um, but came into the space of saying, well, and so what? Um, what what does the equitable transition look like for sustainable energy? Um, for me, I had to get very granular. Um, so we were having a lot of discussions around, um, you know, what does energy burden look like? What does it mean? What does it look like in the district? Um, and I was learning a lot, but what I was missing was the voices of the community. Um, and again, it's me, I just kind of, I'd rather be in the trenches. Um, and I thought, well, we're looking at data. We're still trying to get data. Um, you know, the, my, one of my PhD students working on this is in the audience. She spends a lot of her time getting data and tracking down data. Um, and I think that's, that's a necessary piece of it, understanding what policy is in place, what's coming. And, but we were missing the community voice. And so one thing that we, um, have, 
uh, prioritized in this learning is just speaking um, with community members um, and developing relationships. And for folks who are um, in the academic space or you know, you do big important things, um, whatever it is, um, it's easy. We're so busy doing that, right? I mean, it takes a lot of work. Um, it is easy to allow that to keep you busy. Um, and it's easy to let that busyness occupy all of your space and have your contribution be contributing to that space of what's keeping you busy. Um, and we don't have, you know, there are only a set a number of hours in a day. Um, and so it can be hard um, when you come to, you know, a beautiful campus and beautiful building and are working hard. It can be hard to say, okay, well, how does this actually matter? Who is it impacting? What are the voices? Um, and so what we're doing is we're just in a way that does not align with academic research, I'll be honest, um, saying we kind of have this idea that there are connections between health, access to health, social determinants of health, the existing energy infrastructure, the energy transition, and how it will play out in DC, and the communities that are the most vulnerable in DC and have historically been marginalized. We know there are connections. Um, we can sit in front of our computers and pull up data and draw those connections. Um, or we can spend the time in the communities listening, building relationships, and not going in and talking about energy. We, we don't go in and we don't talk about energy um, in any of these uh, conversations, any of the times we go into the communities. Um, and so that's what we've been doing, um, is we've been listening. We've been building relationships. We've been observing. We're good scientists, so we've been observing. And then we go back to our computers and our labs and our group meetings, and we say, well, what are we learning? What are we observing? Um, one is that energy is not a part of the conversation. I'm not saying it's not important, right? We're looking in, in the background, looking for the connections. Um, but what are we hearing and what are we observing? And what we're hearing and what we're observing um, are the profound needs for healthcare. Um, and access to healthcare um, and accessibility for community members um, to healthcare. Um, and it's interesting what we observe. This is one of these kind of, we, we didn't take notes on this in the conversations that we're having, um, but we noticed that hmm, the places where these conversations are getting done um, are community centers. Um, and they have to wrap up the, the meeting because the kids are out of school and they're banging on the door because the after school program is in the community center. And that after school program is becomes the summer program um, in the summer. And we're thinking, so we're thinking about all these different things. And we thought, well, clearly um, education and childcare is a need, healthcare is a need. So what if we do something around that? We'll think about energy later, but what if we do something around that? What if we partner with the programs that are there and do workshops that drop into the programs that are there um, about health um, and, and what access to health looks like, um, healthcare? What if with the community partner that's providing place-based care in these communities, we do lessons about health? Um, with the students who are there. And then occasionally we say, oh, you know what? On this day, this place-based healthcare clinic will, after the program, will have opportunities for appointments for primary care. Um, what if we, as a part of this, um, build a community garden and use the building of the community garden as lessons in reading and math? Because they're great lessons in that. Um, what if we um, uh, en enable uh, these students to be citizen scientists and uh, learn how to take air quality measurements, water quality measurements, um, and report that to this broader network of citizen scientists and show them how it contributes to data collection and what the power of that data is? 
what's the intersection with energy and the energy transition? We haven't made that explicitly clear. We're working hard, right? Um, we haven't made that explicitly clear, but we know that it's the relationships with the communities um, that will be the foundation upon any of the work we do. And so I saw so much connection um, when I was reading Maya's lot. And I, I was in, a, in the comments we were sharing offline said, my daughter's name is Maya. So I instantly felt, felt the connection. Um, and um, yeah, you know, that's what I see as ha this connection to energy equity is, well, maybe the, the things that we're working on in our research, um, we don't see the direct connection to the communities, but those connections are there and they don't happen without the relationships. And a big part of allowing the research to have impact is enabling, especially the younger generation to learn and develop the confidence and the advocacy. Um, and so that's part of, part of what we're doing. And then the last thing, this is again, off the cuff, it wasn't in the, what I said I'd remark on, but, um, uh, I want to end on a high note, a note of hope. Um, this morning, I was reading a, um, it, people might have heard the NPR story um, about Bangladesh. And um, so the the idea is Bangladesh is a very low-lying country, um, gets flooded quite a bit. Um, and they were pointing to the fact that um, this network of community communication was allowing um, people who live in communities to take data that were that's constantly being communicated back to scientists about water level. And what it allowed them to do is say, water level in the north part of the country is rising because of rains from the mountains where their deforestation has occurred and is causing excessive, you know, even more um, water runoff. Um, during rains, the water level is rising. The, community member who she five times a day goes out and takes these measurements of water. Um, she sends them back to this university researcher. He is seeing that, whoa, the water level is rising faster than we expected. They're able to send out a message that actually gets out. It goes out to mobile phones. It gets out to folks across the country and in the very low-lying areas. Um, and it, they highlight the story of a woman who she doesn't have a phone, but her nephew has a mobile phone and he gets it and he sends the word out to the whole community and everybody's telling each other and they're all able to at least save themselves, not save their homes, but save themselves. Um, and it happened because of this community network and engagement. Um, and at the in the picture in the article shows um, that they're building these houses that are up on these really high stilts out of you know, sustainable approaches, local materials. I sent this to my mother. My, um, I'm Bangladeshi American. My mom is from Bangladesh and she's an architect. Um, and I sent it to her and she texted me back this morning. We're doing this at 5 a.m. And she texted me back this morning and said, that was my thesis project 45 years ago. <laughs> I designed these houses that are elevated. She was like, why did it take 45 years? And I texted her back and I said, mom, it happened in your lifetime. <laughs> the impact happened in your lifetime. That's so profound. So it, it can happen in our lifetimes. Like what we do now, it can have an Im impact. And so I wanted to end on that note. Wow. Um, well, gosh, I, I'm so um, happy to engage with with all of you. And um, I guess I'll tell a little bit of story about my background. I um, previously was an environmental engineer, and um, I did a lot of hazardous waste cleanup. And one of the things that led me to law school was um, working with a client who needed to remediate um, uh, toxic uh, materials in some soils that were right next to a public school. And I was quite horrified um, to realize that they were going to clean up only to the level um, that uh, the law required and not as much as they could have achieved and um, not as much as frankly would have been much better um, for the school kids who would be there. And um, that of course prompted all kinds of questions about who is setting these rules? Um, who has this power? It kind of goes back to um, those those kids, um, who has the power, right? Um, so that's what led me to law school. And um, I thought that I would maybe zoom out. I think that um, so much of, of, of environmental justice is really about 
communities and self-determination within communities. Um, but one of the things that I work on is what is the federal government doing? Um, we know that we have um, an entire system of structural inequity. So um, I thought I would say a few words about uh, what primarily the Biden administration is doing, but it is certainly funded um, quite a bit with Congress um, with these two massive funding uh, statutes that we've seen in the past uh, year and a half or so. Um, so the first thing I thought I'd mention is the Justice 40 initiative, which President Biden established um, in, I think, about his first week um, in office through an executive order. And it provides that 40% of the benefits from various climate initiatives should go to, and, and this is the executive uh, order's term, uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, uh, communities should define how they are um, considered. And so I will probably be using the word um, overburdened instead. Um, so what does this include? And, and I should note, that means there's three things to this, right? Um, benefits, climate initiatives, and those overburdened communities. And so we have to have items that fall into all three of those categories to qualify for this 40% um, uh, policy. So what does that include? Grants, loans, loan guarantees, direct payments, um, federal procurement benefits, federal staffing costs like for technical assistance. Um, what's covered? Um, climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, um, clean transportation, affordable and sustainable housing, training and workforce development, um, remediating legacy pollution, and clean water and wastewater infrastructure. Um, how do we define those um, overburdened communities? This we could spend um, hours on uh, because it's, it's quite an issue at the moment um, if you're following constitutional law and whether um, race-based classifications are going to continue to be constitutional um, or at least uh, what those barriers might be. But um, what we have is the um, Council for Environmental Quality, CEQ, federal agency, has developed uh, the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool. This is essentially um, a mapping data set um, where you can go into census tracts. I encourage everybody to try it for here, to try it from your, your hometowns um, if, if uh, you grew up here in the United States. Um, and it looks at various variables like, like food access, healthcare access, um, linguistic isolation, housing cost burden, um, many things that you could imagine are associated with being an overburdened community. I will say the big, um, the big sort of debate and issue there is that it does not map race. All right, we can talk about why if, if you'd like to do that um, more later. But um, agencies are, are required to use that um, in deciding how to um, uh, allocate the benefits from these clean energy programs. Um, a couple of other things here. Um, first of all, I should note that this is about giving benefits. This is not necessarily about uh, justice in permitting, which of course um, is uh, one of the themes that um, Rebecca has engaged. Um, so that's an entirely separate set of policies um, that to my mind needs quite a bit of revision, particularly around um, public participation. So permitting, requires an analysis under the National um, Environmental Policy Act, at least for, for major federal actions, like an air permit at a power plant, for example. Um, and the, the analysis that is required um, to, to support that NEPA process uh, is, is, I find to be quite unsatisfactory, right? Um, it, it, it requires sort of a recapping of the environmental justice um, sort of parameters that you might find in a particular community where something um, will be permitted or cited. Um, it requires a, 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 an essay, um, a sort of a reason giving um, that the, the proponent of the, of the permit will, will go into about why cite it here, what are the potential impacts. But as long as everything is considered and there's public participation, which, which is bean counting, Okay, right now, public participation is measured by how many hearings did we hold? How many mailings did we send? 
how many people came. Um, that's nothing to say about how did we work to remove barriers <laughs> to participation? Um, what did we do to make sure to, to, to satisfy ourselves that the voices of the people in these communities were actually heard? And then how can we actually reflect that what we heard has made an impact in the ultimate decision-making? NEPA does not require that there be an impact in the ultimate decision-making. It just requires the essay. Okay, so that's the other piece of environmental justice um, from the federal perspective. Let me come back to, um, to Justice Forty. Thank you for indulging that tangent. Um, one of the big issues that's on the table now is how to um, measure progress, how to actually hold the federal agencies accountable um, for how they spend all of this money. Um, we are expecting any day now this spring for CEQ to issue their scorecard. And um, the idea is they're going to give grades to the federal agencies like A, B, C, D failing um, in, in three big buckets of categories. Um, one is, um, is the agency reducing disproportionate burdens? Is the agency actually fulfilling its spending obligation? Um, it's, it shouldn't be sitting on the money, it should be getting that out. Um, and is the agency actually creating systems internally to confront environmental justice issues? Um, so one of the big questions, of course, is how do we count? If we count only the money that is spent, um, even if we just map that onto communities that are overburdened um, on a number of these variables, I'm not sure we're really measuring um, the environmental justice. I'm not sure we're me measuring the, the, the equity of the outcomes or the, the, the self-determination of the community um, that, that to which theoretically monetary benefits flowed. And so one of the things I thought we might talk about, um, I'm certainly thinking about this, is um, what should we be measuring in a scorecard? And, and you know, part of this is a practical question, right? The government has to figure out ways to measure things and it has to be measurable things. Um, and that I think gets really hard when we start talking about um, how do we how do we say okay this this community actually um, had a win when we know um, so often the outcomes are not 100% wins they're partial wins um, I, and and we also know of course with procedures um, if we're thinking about um, how our community is able to be engaged. Um, in the decision making that results in these benefits flowing, um, just counting how many people come to a meeting or how many letters were sent out um, isn't really going to do it, especially um, if uh, it's hard to trace um, the the voice of the people who have something to say to a particular outcome. So I'm very curious. Um, uh, Rebecca, maybe putting it back to you um, for discussion, or if anybody here, um, any of, of you all have ideas about um, how should things be measured? Let's say we're going to have the government scorecard. I'm not sure that's going to be enough um, to really hold these agencies accountable. So thanks. Quickly chime in before we offer uh, Mr. Bradsby's an opportunity to respond. Um, so I, I thought those were just outstanding perspectives that we just heard um, better than I even imagined in assembling such a wonderful group of panelists. Um, and so I, I think on that theme of the next generation of environmental leaders, uh, I think Professor Hammond raised a very important uh, starting point for us when, when they said that there is a terminology starting point that, that is more thorny than we may realize. I mean, if, if, if race comes out of environmental justice, it was a big piece of what we understood environmental justice to mean. And if the operative term now being disadvantaged, which certainly conjures up certain understandings and misunderstandings, and does overburdened get us to a place that's closer to where we ought to be in, in evaluating what it means to be an environmental justice community and, and how is that measured? I mean, that's that we could literally spend the rest of the year just talking about that. So I think that's a really important starting point. And then how we engage all of the other sources of support about helping environmental justice communities get better protection. We've heard a variety of perspectives uh, from, from, from history and science and 
community engagement that uh, are, are all very important as we think about what's next for us for environmental justice uh, at, at the federal, international, state, local levels. So um, I, I, I want to turn it over to Professor Bradsby's for her reactions to the reactions. And then if it's a couple minutes, we can, we can hear from uh, the panelists who's on the, uh, in, in turn. Um, I, I, we don't have a lot of time, and um, what I do want to say is every time I hear overburdened communities, you know what drives me crazy? Underburdened isn't a word, right? If a community is overburdened, it's because they are bearing more than their share of our collective burdens, and that means that other communities have transferred burdens to them and are underburdened. Right, they bear fewer burdens than their fair share. And that's not even a word in English. And that is, I think, indicative of the level of invisibilized privilege that shapes so much of what we're talking about. And if we want things to be different, we have to do things differently. And putting the people who've been marginalized at the center, at the start, at the beginning, not at the end, we'll come to you with a plan, say, oh, we have a, a consultation obligation under NEPA. Here's what we're going to do. What do you think? Thanks. Um, but it, when the problems are defined, and that was the thing that struck me about both of, um, both of your comments, is that what you were talking about, translated through my brain, is having communities and having people with lived experience be part of the defining of what are the problems in our society? What do we need to prioritize? What needs to be solved? Not coming in at the end saying, what do you think of the solution? Right, though that has to happen too, but being part of the beginning. And that is what I think is both a potential and a peril of the Justice 40, which of course is modeled on New York's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which has done, a, I would say a mixed bag in terms of having community voices be part of the defining of what are the problems that we are going to prioritize as a state and um, what are the choices that we're facing and what do we think about them? You know. There's things to learn from the New York experience. Um, we just completed our map of disadvantaged communities. It's a mixed bag. Um, some extremely wealthy communities are on the list and the community that I am working with in Jamaica, um, a neighborhood that is impacted by not only the waste transfer stations I told you about, but also by uh, intense truck traffic um, to and from JFK Airport did not make the list, right? Because there wasn't adequate consultation at the beginning. We hired the state hired consultants who did a good job using the data that they had, but what they didn't do is what you were talking about. They didn't go into communities and say, hey, what do you think? Hey, what should we look at? What are some of the indicators we should use? Like air, proximity to airport wasn't even an indicator, even though the noise and the pollution and the water quality is unbelievably impacted. Well, that only affects Queens. So if there was nobody from Queens on the panel making the decision, they didn't think about it. And that is, I think, what we see over and over and over again. When there aren't people with lived experience who are part of the conversations at every step of the path from the beginning through the middle to the end then then injustice replicates itself maybe because of animus but even when even when there isn't intentional animus it replicates itself because we don't see and that's what you were just talking about right how can the government see this right how can we reduce this into something that the government can see and measure and therefore make happen. I think one of the things we should be doing is adding environmental justice to job descriptions. 
adding it to the ways that people are, are, are told what their job is when they're hired and then are evaluated for promotions and, um, and raises while they're doing it. I sit on New York City's Environmental Justice Advisory Board. I've really been pushing for that as part of our study of the city. So far, I haven't gotten very far, but we need to think about how do we make this everybody's job? So I'm just gonna stop because I keep talking and I wanna hear what you guys have to say. I don't know if we have any comments. I can ask, uh, sure, I can ask a question. Um, so I was curious, you were talking about um, making sure when you were building these communities, particularly in Detroit, where they're crowd for funding to buy the block, that it fits within the legal framework such that it doesn't get overturned later. And I was curious if part of that process was actually looking at maybe how to deconstruct some of the existing laws because it may be something that's beneficial to the community, but because of how the process has been you know, created, it's, it's simply not legal. And so thinking about that undoing of past legal, legal processes. Yeah, and so, yes. And so when you are thinking about that, absolutely deconstructing legal concepts like eminent domain, um, bringing things under public protection, using conservation law to protect some of these spaces are also options, right? particularly when you're talking about buying back the block. Now with the rise and re-acknowledgement of CFDIs through some of the justice funding initiatives that um, Dean Hammond was talking about, there might be an opportunity there, this would be a great law review article for perhaps one of my students, to look at the role of CFDIs and banking law in protecting some of these spaces. But that is a challenge is that it is creative. And as my colleague pointed out, the technology is already there. It's in front of us. They're already doing community governance on blockchain. So how do we take that and translate that into a legal construct that our system will understand as opposed to rejecting it on demand, which is what we're having. So absolutely, those are great ideas. Thank you. Yeah. 